talk about something that um, happened nearly 20 years ago and I think for the best part of it, it's been forgotten to um, you know a great degree to be honest because it's something that we don't even think about now it's um, the legacy of the year 2000 now if you roll back the clock before um, 1999 um, people were worried about what would happen in the year 2000 when computers rolled over to the new date format because you got to remember there's a lot of computers out there that um, didn't have the ability to have a four digit date stamp as, as in say in 1999 they had 99 or prior to that, 98, 97, 96, 95, and so on. So when it got to 99, it rolled over to 00. zero. Now, the biggest reason for that is to save memory. Because you've got to remember that every bit and every byte counted on a lot of these earlier computers, especially the ones that <clears throat> we kind of talk about now. Um, the classic machines, you know, your classic microcomputers where they only had very limited memory as well. But it's not only them. You've got to remember that the early PCs, a lot of them had um, a BIOS that was set with only two digits for the date stamp. So if a lot of the PCs came around out in about 1987, onwards to sort of the early to mid 90s they also had a two digit date stamp and that caused problems because i'm not sure how you know with the advent of the pc being so prevalent within the business and the home market i'm not sure why they thought that a two digit date stamp would be an okay legacy to carry on even up to sort of the mid 1990s because you'd only have a very short period before that computer became somewhat obsolete really because once it rolled over to 2000 it went back to zero zero or in a lot of cases it went back to 1900 as far as the BIOS was concerned now it might not seem that big of a deal having a calendar or your buyers rolling over to zero zero or 1900. You know, you can kind of live with that. You can kind of live with, okay, it's not really 1900, but we can kind of cope with it being zero zero. But software that was also using the date stamp of double digits, of two digits. And that included things like spreadsheets, databases, anything that used a date stamp for file formats, anything that used a date stamp for modifying your files on your hard drive, anything at all that is modified by using a date stamp was affected. So it wasn't as small a deal as a lot of people thought it was going to be. But was it as scary? Were we expecting the planes to fall out of the sky? Were we expecting satellites to fall out of space? Were we expecting the nuclear button to suddenly be pressed when it went to zero zero? Which is all the papers and all the media at the time were kind of suggesting. Well, that didn't quite happen. Didn't happen in that way. But it did have an effect. There were cases, especially on older military hardware, where zero zero affected the software. The software simply didn't run. You know, it caused a, a crash or a system crash. It also affected a lot of small business machines, where, as I said, if you, you're having a spreadsheet or you're having date stamped files on your hard drive, well, it affects all of those files. So trying to search for something from the year zero zero as according to your date stamp was going to cause problems but did it justify the 
billions of pounds spent on trying to correct this kind of problem. Why couldn't they just have rolled over new hardware? You know, why couldn't they have gone out and upgraded their machines? Well, that was a huge outlay for big businesses. And then it was a huge outlay for small businesses and personal users. So there were fixes or pseudo fixes or about in that area. And I'm going to kind of lead you through one of them now. The first time really that it was kind of hitting the big time was leading up to around about 1997 and it started because it was only about a three year gap between the millennium or the year 2000 people were starting to get worried because it wasn't that far off into the future so in around about I think it was January 19 97 I was um, traveling from Durham to Huntingdon with um, a colleague um, and we were driving back um, to Huntingdon from a, a meeting up in Durham and we started talking about this and we started talking about how it would affect things and how we were going to be able to tell if a computer or a BIOS was going to fail and we kind of sort of shot the breeze a little bit all the way down and um, I came up with a very simple solution of a bit of software that interrogated the BIOS and a bit of software that interrogated the date stamps on hard drives and so on just quite a very simple routine nothing outlandish and um, you know we, the conversation ended when we got to where we were going and didn't really think a lot of it and then it was getting on to late 1998 and into 1999 that a piece of software came out which was virtually basically what we discussed using almost the same ideals and almost the same substance to the, to the software that we were discussing and this bit of software was called Prove It 2000 and it was marketed heavily it was marketed all across especially the UK there were current magazines with adverts all posted all over them and when I finally got hold of a copy because it was a subsidiary of the same company that we were working for um, I discovered it was literally what I'd suggested and the, but the problem was on the way down in the car although the idea and the spec was kind of loosely kind of given out there in those three and a bit hours or four hour drive what they put into practice wasn't good enough it was just it was a fudge it was it was kind of a half-hearted attempt to appease people with computers that may have only been three or four years old and that got me thinking to how much and how much other software out there and how much other different forms of testing were out there were actually legitimate although this bit of software did check the BIOS and it did check the date stamp and it did loosely interrogate the file system it didn't actually test all of the software that was on the machine all of the programs all of the routines it was just a very basic well the hardware is y2k compliant or not and that wasn't enough but judging by every other application that was out there and every other similar product that was out there to do the same that's all it did it just tested the hardware if the hardware was compliant it was assumed for most cases that everything else would be compliant and the biggest problem with that is it wasn't true none of it was true none of it was a hundred percent above board and it just seemed like a quick money making scheme it's the way of the world that some people are going to say it's um 
you know, to where you earn money in the way you build business and so on. But it was such a short-sighted product. They all were because they all came out in that 12 months gap between 1999 and the year 2000. Now, studies since <clears throat> have stated that there are two sides to the Y2K. Firstly, the IT industry did everything it could to prevent it. <laughs> no, that simply isn't the case. The other study is, is that the actual bug was a bit of a hoax, was a bit of an overhyped marketing ploy to sell new machines. And that was part of it. Not the hype, but the ploy to sell upgraded product. Now I know this simply by the amount of machines that were purchased on the back of this simple program that was called Prove It 2000. Um, and I know this by the amount of upgrades on motherboard replacements and so on that were actually sent out because of this product. But the products, regardless of what they were called, weren't particularly needed. You know, all it needed was to check what the software recorded the date stamp as, what your bias originally set your date as. And it was just as simple as that for most people. Did the industry solve it or didn't they? Well, the industry kind of solved it because it got the ball rolling into people upgrading their hardware and their software prior to the time. But did it actually solve the issue of the machines that are and the software that are at the time being compliant? It didn't really, did it? It was just a case of this simple program says you've got a two digit date stamp, it's time to upgrade your machine. And I think that's what happened predominantly throughout the industry at that time. You know, a big rush of upgrading computers and buying new software or having patches for software because of it. Now, where all of this hype came from about planes falling from the skies, you know electricity companies not being able to supply electricity um your shopping and your till you know your till and your accounting departments in major department stores and businesses wouldn't be able to function the whole ecosystem would kind of ground to a halt um no i mean the the thing that a lot of people forgot at that point is that we weren't as reliant on computers as we are now. We are relying much more on computers now than we ever were nearly 20 years ago. And it kind of begs the question, what's the next big bug that's going to hit the system? Well, the year 2000 was, or the, the the Millennium Bug, as it was called, or Y2K, was really the first big time or massive scale time that the computer industry was challenged. And for most parts, it kind of rose to the occasion and it kind of spawned people to upgrade. But compared to now, where we have issues almost on a daily basis with attacks on systems, ransomware, spam, you know, you've got viruses going around, you have all sorts of system-wide disruption almost on a daily basis. 99% of it never gets reported, it gets trapped and it gets dealt with. The problem is is that nowadays the Y2K issue wouldn't have even figured. It wouldn't have even been newsworthy because it was a relatively simple fix. So, in reality, a lot of people made a lot of money out of 
what was classed as a huge issue the Millennium Bug. A lot of people made a lot of money out of providing fixes that really didn't need to be there. Testing software that didn't need to be sold. Because most of it was just having a look at the software and how it recorded the date. And that was basically the crux of the Millennium Bug. There were no system-wide crashes, there were no system-wide ransomware, there were no system-wide viruses to the point that we have that bring down huge companies and even government machines nowadays. So in retrospect, they had it quite easy. Seems quite funny now, thinking back, about all the hype that was around that era. But it was one of those things, you know, you move on, you learn by it. And it it's not really going to be repeated again, <clears throat> because we have quite a long time before even a a four digit date stamps kind of run out of digits and I doubt the hardware that's around now will be around then so we're fairly safe on that ground but to all those people who bought into this because of the media because of the scaremongering because of wanting to make sure that their computers were safe after the year 2000 what it did was plant the seeds for the next generation of attacks on computers and I think that's the biggest irony is because prior to that we didn't have the mass attacks on computers that we do now and networks and subsystems and servers but once we found out that we were vulnerable to hype, vulnerable to marketing, I think that left the floodgates open for people to take, to kind of take issue with anything they wanted to. So if they want had an issue with a company, they could try and bring it down or bring their networks down, stop payments being transferred crash PCs, crash systems, crash hot servers. And I think at the end of the day, that was the biggest downfall of widely publicizing a bug, as they called it, which basically amounted to nothing at the end of the day. And it's a shame. But it's a piece of computing history and it's one of those things that you know you look back on and you think yeah was that it was that it thank you